Thank you, Grace, musicians. That was awesome. <clears throat> okay. Welcome, everybody. It's really nice to see you here today. I'd like, if you're new here today, I don't know whether you're too shy, but would you like to stand up? Because we'd like to really welcome uh, any newcomers today to our service. No? Well, look, it's all right if you're too shy to stand up. We just want to let you know that there's a welcome desk outside in the foyer. And on there is a, uh, a little card that's got um, a, what do you call it, a, what do you call a little thing? Yeah, <laughs> the barcode. And if you, if you scan that, it will tell you everything. It'll bring you to information that's all about our church, okay? So that'd be, that's really cool, really lovely, yeah. And make yourself known because we want to get to know you, okay? just want to remind you today of our vision, which is transformed lives, trans transforming cities. And we just really desire to see the city of Sydney changed. Amen? Amen? Oh, that wasn't very loud. Amen? Amen. Yeah. We want to see the city of Sydney changed because our city needs Jesus. Our city is desperate for Jesus, but they just don't know it. And so, you know, um, uh, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, you know, um, it, it says that anyone who is in Christ, he is a new creation. When you come to Jesus, I thank God that he changes our lives. He comes in and he transforms us from the inside. When we come before him with an honest heart and say, Lord, I need you. Jesus, I would do whatever it takes to know you and repent of your sin. Then you will know what it is like to uh, have a transformed heart, transfor a transformed mind. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, that is our new, that's our theme. In fact, that theme runs all year round. And, um, yeah. So, <clears throat> right. Just going to hand over to Corey. But, uh, I know. Good morning. I've just got a few uh, to run through. Won't take us long. Um, so we're going to have some baptisms on the 19th. So we've had our baptism class. There is a membership class this Tuesday. So if you are interested in becoming a member, if you say, you know, I've been going to this church for a long time, but I haven't really declared this to be my home church, then if you want to become a member, there is a Zoom class on Tuesday night hosted by Ronit. Um, and so if you want to become a member, uh, you can learn everything about that Tuesday night. Um, if you, how do we, how do we say this? Maybe in a grace claw kind of way. I want to challenge you. Um, <laughs> I want to challenge you that you are part of the body. And every part of the body has a part to play in the body. And so I challenge you, uh, to get involved and, um, if you want to help out with AV, there is a need uh, right now. Um, it, there, there's a real need. So if you're waiting, going, oh, yeah, they have other people. They don't. They don't. And there's no they. It's we. We need you. So we need us. So if you're at all interested in that, talk to Tiff, Chris, anyone at the desk, Eldora, uh, Sam. Yeah, talk to Sam Burt. Um, they will teach you, they will train you in a low-stress environment uh, to help out in, um, okay, it might not be super low, but, um, but yeah, help out. That'd be great. We need, we need you, especially with Jean on leave. If she came back and we had like a full team, that would be like the glory descending for Jean. So let's bless Jean when she comes back. Yeah, all right. 
uh, a few dates. We've done this over the past few weeks. Want to get these in your calendar because you're going to plan your holidays and you're going to realize it clashes with geraldry and that cannot happen. So if your kids are in high school, we've got a geraldry mission trip. Uh, it has been a really uh, important piece in a lot of people's lives. And so it's happening this year again. Uh, you see the other ones. Especially take note. Church camp. Get that one in there. Father's Day weekend. Church camp. You can still do Father's Day evening with, you know, you, know, you can sort that out. But you're going to be at church camp over that weekend. It's going to be really good. Um, put that in your diary. I don't know. Are you coming back up? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. It's time for our offering. So I would just like the ushers to come down and just get prepared for, for our offering. And just while we're doing that, <clears throat> you know, I just want to uh, re just remind you about our offering that John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, say it with me, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah. So this is giving as a reminder to us that of the blessings that God gave us through Jesus. Love is the motivating force. God gave us his son. When he gave us his son, he gave us everything. And he gave us himself and Jesus. And God gave, God gave in response to our need. The world needed Jesus and God gave his son. So that's why we are giving this morning. Okay, thank you guys. Lord, we just um, thank you that we can come this morning and give to you. And while we're giving to you, Lord, we just want to thank you for the, from the bottom of our hearts as to how wonderful you are and how much you've given to us. Lord, you are glorious and we thank you so much that we can be standing here saved and knowing you, knowing your presence, knowing your love. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Lord, we just are responding to you today because of what you've done to us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, thank you. And <clears throat> in a few moments... Um, Oh, sorry, one of the things that I didn't say is that um, that you can also give electronically. Um, yeah, so you, if you haven't got anything with you today, you can give electronic, electronically. Um, yeah, and I think you'll find the information for that on the app. The church has got an app, yeah. I tried to get into it the other day, but I couldn't. I've got some homework to do. Okay. And just, um, yeah, so what we want is the, in a couple of minutes, uh, Dig JC are going to be going out to their own program. So Dig JC, if you'd like to stand right now. I want you to stand, not move. Dig JC, just stand right now. Yeah. Father, just put your hand toward them, okay? Father, we thank you for this group of young people. We pray this morning that as they go out and have their program, Lord, that you will minister to them. Pray, Lord, that seeds will be sown into their hearts and lives today, Lord, and that they will see themselves in a new light. They will see themselves as Jesus truly sees them today. Lord, do something in their heart today. Pray that you would anoint the leaders, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay, you can go. And I'd just like to uh, invite Enrique to come up and read the scripture for us. Here he comes. <clears throat> Thank you.
Good morning, church. Um, today's scripture reading is from Matthew 12, verse 9 to 14. Going on from that place, he went into the synagogue, and a man with shriveled hand was there, looking for, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a ship and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, you will not take hold of it and lift it out. How much more valuable is a person than a ship? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisee went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Look at that. Hey, do you want to take that? Okay, that's great. Beautiful. All right, let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you so much, God, that you are with us that your promise was that you would be with us now till the end of the age, that you are with us now. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would reveal Jesus to us. Lord, help us to become aware of your presence. Help us to become just aware of your goodness, your love, who you are and who you're calling us to be. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our minds. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in a series where we're talking about soft hearts, sharp minds, hard feet, open hands. Um, this is the home screen wallpaper on every Wesley Mission laptop. That's it. You can't change it. It's there. Um, it has sparked a lot of good conversations amongst our chaplains with staff who, who are Christians, staff who are not Christian, but who are on board with Wesley Mission, but weren't aware that they were part of a spirit-led disciple-making movement. They thought they were just doing out-of-home care, right? And so it's been a, it's been a great kind of discussion piece, but on, on the side here are the, the values of Wesley Mission, and... Um, what we're doing in this series is we want to draw out what it looks like to live in a Christ-like manner, and we're going to see how Jesus exhibits these values. These aren't just values that we thought, oh, these are good corporate values. This is like, no, this is what we see in the life of Jesus, and what Jesus calls us as disciples to walk in. And so what we're going to be uh, exploring today is sharp minds uh, and what it looks like um, to have the mind of Christ, what it looks like to have a sharp mind. Um, but as, as we go through this, really sharp minds is about, is about not kind of leaving your mind at the door. i got to make myself comfortable here. Hold on a second. Um, it's not about having a dull mind. It's not about just having a, a mind that just goes with whatever, but it's about thinking these things through, thinking everything through. And bringing it before the Lord. And having a sharp mind. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Hard feet is about the willingness to go into hard places. When I was in Haiti, they, we, had, um, they, we were just on the shore, and these kids, they didn't have shoes, so they just had hard feet. I mean, they could go anywhere. There were these piles of shells. And not like soft, like little fine shells, like hard shells, like just piles of them. And they just run across them with bare feet. And when I think of hard feet, I remember that. It's such a blazing image in my mind. But I think of that being willing to go anywhere and do anything to follow Jesus with hard feet. Calloused feet. Calloused feet that have been there and are willing to go to the next level. Uh, soft hearts. Share, uh, Stu shared about that last week. So I won't talk too much about that. And it's pretty self-explanatory of all the four. Uh, open hands is really about holding holding uh, everything with an open hand. So there's a generosity posture of it. But there's also a posture of kind of not holding on to what we have 
and, and holding on to our legacy and, and kind of preserving that legacy, but kind of going, no, 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 this is, we have to walk wherever Jesus leads us. So we're not going to hold our reputation tightly. We're going we're gonna to be open-handed about it. We're, we're going we're gonna to follow Jesus wherever he leads us. Hard feet, open hands. Today we're going to be looking at sharp minds, and I want to draw your attention as well. You're, you're going to see the links. We just did a, a whole series on spiritual warfare, right? And you're going to see links to that throughout this. When we look at these values, when we're, we're called to have a sharp mind, the battlefield in the spiritual realm, the battlefield is your mind, right? Satan wants to control what you think. He's after your mind. And so what it looks like to have a sharp mind is to be able to pierce that through with wisdom and discernment to say what is of the Lord and what is not of the Lord. Um, Having a sharp mind means a a mind that's led by the Spirit. So Romans 8, this morning, I love our prayer meeting in the city. I got to tell you, like, our prayer meeting in the city kicks Ride's butt. Like, every week, you know, like, the prayer meeting in the city is so encouraging. But this verse came up in the prayer meeting, and, and I just thought, oh, man, this is it. It's, uh, it's from Romans 8, 5. It says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the thing of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. Right? Carnally minded means if you're always thinking about the things of this world, man, that is death. If you're always thinking about the things that you need, the, the, the physical things, that is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Wow. We could chew on that for the whole week. Your, your soul training, chew on that verse. <laughs> Romans 8, 5 and 6. Write that down. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. And that's what we're going to see when we look at Jesus today. In, in Matthew 12, we're going to see that to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So, Matthew 12, uh, we had it read out. Thank you, Enric, for reading that out. Um, but I'm going to start a little bit earlier to give you a bit of context going into verse 9. In, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus is walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath day. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck the heads of grain and eat it, which is harvesting, which is a breaking of the Sabbath rules, okay, uh, according to the Pharisees. And so when the Pharisees saw it, they said to Jesus, they said, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. They didn't come with a question. They didn't say, oh, I wonder if this is law. They, no, 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 no. Look, they're breaking the law. What are you going to do about it, Jesus? It's... And Jesus said to them, fascinating what he says, sharp mind. He says, have you not read when David was with his mighty men and they were, they were uh, fleeing a battle and they, they went in to uh, the, the, the place, and I'll just read it. He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Have you read that? Of course, that's a little bit of a jab at them because of course they'd read that. They had that memorized. They knew the story. But Jesus is saying, if you read that the way it's supposed to be read, then you would read it differently. Or, have you not read in the law? Now, of course, they'd read in the law, right? Have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? They do all kinds of work on the Sabbath. But they're guiltless. And I tell you, Something greater than the temple is here. Grain fields. Something greater than the temple is here in the grain fields. (laughs) And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, then you would have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. It's an interesting interaction. I want you to, when you read the Bible with the 
clear and a keen mind and a sharp mind, I want you to ask questions. Whenever you read, ask questions you don't know the answer to. What are the Pharisees doing in the grain field? It's not their natural habitat. What are they doing there? Are they following Jesus? Did they just happen to come upon him? Are they doing that, like, walk at a distance, keep an eye kind of awkward thing, right? Look, you know? Were they, like, hiding in the grain fields? Probably not. (laughs) Jumping out. Look, I just saw it. They broke the law on the Sabbath. What are you going to do about it? It's interesting, Jesus says to them, if you knew what this means, desire, I desire mercy and not sa- sacrifice. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I think what Jesus is getting at there is, I, I'm come for the people, not the rules. Right? But I desire mercy and not sacrifice. If you'd understand that, you would have not condemned the guiltless. See, what Jesus is getting at with these two stories, these two questions, and then that statement, he's saying, you know what, I don't like this condemning thing that you're doing. You know, when we condemn or accuse, we're partnering with the accuser. You realize that, right? So I'll say to my kids sometimes, they'll, they'll be accusing each other, and I'll be like, hold on, hold on, don't partner with Satan right now. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> right? That's kind of a strong thing to say, right? But they get it. And in that accusation, they know what they're doing, don't they? Sometimes we don't realize it, though, because we're just so used to it. We're in a culture that accuses and condemns all the time. It's the water we swim in. But Jesus is not swimming in that water. He's like, no, 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 no. You, if you knew, if you knew the heart of God, you wouldn't condemn the guilty. If you knew what it means to desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not condemn the guiltless. So now, the next verse is, he went on from there and entered their synagogue. Whose synagogue? (laughs) Their synagogue. He's on their turf now, right? In the grain field, he's kind of in neutral ground now. He's gone into their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him. Now, this is important. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And Jesus can see that. I mean, he sees that right away, right? So that they might accuse him. So they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, to accuse him? And he said to them, again, he answers their question. Now, this is genius, what he does. He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if your sheep falls into a pit on a Sabbath day, will not pull the sheep out? Raise the hand. Now, there was no, there was no chapter and verse for you can pull a sheep out on a Sabbath. There's no chapter and verse. But the rabbis, they always, they always argued over this kind of stuff. And they still do today, by the way. So um, you can still look that up. There's people arguing about what you can do on the Sabbath day and what you can't do on a Sabbath day. And if a sheep falls into a pit on a Sabbath day, and like some people are like, well, if it's late in the day and the sun's about to set, you should just wait. Like, well, if the sheep's not going to die, you should just leave it till the next day. Right? Like, if it's an emergency to save a life, you can do it, but otherwise, no. Right? There's so many debates about this. And so Jesus enters right into their debate. He knows they're having the debate. And he right, enters right into the debate. He's like, raise your hand. Who wouldn't do it? Who wouldn't pull the sheep out? And then he says, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? Another question. And so it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched out his hand and was restored healthy like the other. But when the Pharisees saw it, they went out and conspired against him how they might destroy him. I want to ask you a question now. How does Jesus demonstrate a sharp mind? So to do this, um, there's going to be three questions. 
and it's going to be you talking to the people next to you. So I want you to get in groups of two or three. If you're sitting alone, move. You've got to move. I don't want, I don't want to see you all going on my phone because I don't want <laughs> you got to move to the people around you. You've, I'm going to give you two minutes. I'm going to time myself so I actually give you two minutes. I'm going to give you two months to talk this through. How does Jesus demonstrate having a sharp mind in these two stories that I've just said? And if you need some help, you can turn to Matthew 12, right? Matthew 12. Two minutes. Talk about it. What are, what, how does Jesus demonstrate a sharp mind? about 15 seconds left. All right, this is what I want to do. I heard some discussion. Hope it was good. Can't really hear uh, what you said. So I want you to, big voice, uh, what are some things that maybe somebody in your group shared that you thought, man, that's gold? Anyone? Sharp mind. Who's got a sharp mind around you? Anyone? Nice and loud. Yeah, that's good. So, so I'm going to try and nutshell that, but it's, it's the idea that this asking the question kind of sheds the light on their own selfishness. It sheds the light on their own uh, presuppositions here of what they're bringing to this. And so Jesus isn't saying, hey, you're dead wrong about this. He's asking them a question so that they can see where their motivation is and, and what they're thinking. Yeah, okay, great. Who else? Mm. Yeah, that's good. So he's applying his wisdom and knowledge, and he's using the scriptures and in, in a way where these guys know the scriptures back to front as well. So it's not just about using scriptures, right? It's about understanding the heart of God as the scriptures portray it, all right? So he's using his wisdom to do that. It's really good. What else? <laughs> oh, microphone is. Hello. Wow. Uh, I said, I said, uh, Jesus understood the Old Testament for what it truly represents, not just the law. Yep. Which yeah, is that's good. Yeah. 
Ga Gab also said something that was quite insightful, so I'll pass it on to him. <laughs> like, uh, Jesus has, like, good discernment, I think, of what, like, the scripture says, but also, like, what's also good. Yeah, all right, cool. That's great. Anyone else? How does Jesus have a sharp mind here? Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, so Jesus wasn't forceful with them, right? It's not a yelling match. Matthew does not record for us a yelling match in the synagogue, right? He's just holding up the mirror. It's really powerful. Yeah, that's good insight. Yeah. Anything else? One more? All right, you're going to need another chance because I've got two more questions. But, um... But it's good, like, uh, you guys have touched on some of those things. Uh, it's interesting, what I see in Jesus, is he's not backing down from them. He doesn't go, oh, I don't want to, he's not worried about who he's going to offend here. He knows he's going to offend people. It's just, it's going to be par for the course. But he doesn't back down from that, but he doesn't just run headlong into it either. He's very, he, he comes with wisdom and awareness I want you to think about what's at stake for Jesus in this. What's at stake in this interaction, right? If you think about what's going on, this is going to be your next question, but I, I really want you to think about when the Pharisees say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they're pointing to this guy with a withered hand. What's at stake for Jesus in that very moment? He doesn't have time to think, you know? It's not like Jesus went away for 20 minutes and then came back. What's at stake, and what is kind of Jesus wrestling with there, just in that few seconds where they present that to him? I want you to share maybe how you would react to that, or, or better yet, what is at stake for Jesus in that very moment that he's going to respond to? So I'll give you another couple of minutes. Talk that through. What's at stake for Jesus in the withered hand story especially? Go. I'm going to bring you back in a 10 seconds or so, let you wrap up. All right. Anybody want to share anything that you heard in your little group? Um, just maybe just give June the mic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Now, who, who would like to share? Yeah? Mm. At the same time, Jesus um, demonstrated his authority. The deity of God is there. 
but he also aware that the moment the authority is exhibited, there's a cost. Just like all our missionary, the moment you commit your life to go out and share the gospel, there's a cost mm. and even death. Yeah. Are you prepared to give your life to that ground, hard land? Yeah. It's cost. And Jesus is aware of that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, who else? What's at stake in that question? Nice and loud, just to shout it out. Anyone? Moment. <laughs> Okay, so we were talking, actually, like, this whole area was talking about reputation mm. uh, in that um, if the Pharisees went out and kind of gossiped about what Jesus was doing, it could affect, I guess, how other people would um, view his teaching, you know? And even if he's, yeah, um, yeah speaking the truth, like, they're kind of almost coming against it with, yeah, gossip, yeah. kind of ruined his image. Um, Bell had something good to say about, like, um, do you want to share it? <laughs> I'll just say, just tell us what Bell said. Uh, well, Bell, um, <laughs> she was saying, um, <laughs> it was like, um, <laughs> okay, give it to Bell. No, I'm <laughs> serious. It wasn't just about like the situation at hand at that time, but and it, it like, it's more like that situ the heart of what was going on in that situation um, was what was being like it's almost like because he had so much influence what happened in that situation like could spread to so much more people yeah yeah that's really yes. good so what's going to happen in this moment is going to echo so it's kind of both what you're both saying right mm. it's this idea of like what's what's being what how he responds people are going to talk about it it's not just like going to stay in the synagogue right so he's very aware of that. And, and a few verses later, Jesus actually says to the people that he healed, don't spread this about. So he is thinking about how people are talking about him, how people are talking about his, his response. And he wants to be clear. But he doesn't back away. And he comes right back with it. Yeah. Maybe one more. Anyone else? Just like, yeah, this needs to be said. Anything? I'll go. Yeah, nice. Um, I guess piggybacking off what Belle was saying and the group over there, um, potentially his life, and mm. hence why um, he's careful because he knows that the Pharisees are out to get him, and it's not quite the point yet in the story where it ends, so to say, and so he has to be careful about how that impacts his life because of the broader climate, not just with the Pharisees and how they view him, but even potentially the political yeah. climate at the time with the Pharisees and the empire and how they view that whole yeah. situation. Yeah, he, he knows that they've set this up as a trap, right? This is, this is set up as a trap to accuse him. And it's like, what are they going to do with that, right? Now, now, there's a few things that I want to point out in this that, um, that are fascinating and just below the surface in this. I think one of the things that is at stake for Jesus in this scenario when I, when I imagine it is the Pharisees pointing out the man with a withered hand. Right? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they're using this man who has a disability as an object lesson. And so Jesus is going to speak to that very clearly. Because he goes, well, what one of you who has a sheep, if the sheep falls into the pit, doesn't pull it out on the Sabbath? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? It, notice that? It's not like, so therefore, if you would do that on the Sabbath, do this on the Sabbath. That's not what he does. That's not the parallel. The, the, the next question is, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? And the answer to that is, man is made in the image of God. And what Jesus is doing with this man, who, who they're treating as an object lesson, he's saying, no, this man is made in the image of God. And you may see him as something less because he has this shriveled hand, but I'll tell you what. 
how much more valuable is he than a sheep? So he's defending the vulnerable with that. In Mark 3, he gives us a little bit more uh, insight into this, adds another detail. It said that Jesus looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, before he says, stretch out your hand. So in Matthew, he gives us these two stories, but leaves out this detail. Mark adds this detail. It's fascinating, because what they were seeing in Jesus, they saw that he was angry. Now, not, I want you to think about, don't just face value this. Think about this. Why is Jesus angry? It's there. <laughs> their hardness of heart. He's angry and he's grieved at their hardness of heart. Soft heart. Right? That's what we're talking about. Soft heart. Open hand. Sharp mind. Why is he grieved? This isn't going to be your question. I'll answer it for you. He's grieved at their hardness of heart. And I think this parallels, again, what we're talking about with the spiritual warfare series. What has made their heart go hard? Right? It's just these different ideas and different, like the battlefield is the mind. And they have been conditioned. They've been conditioned to think that it's more important to follow the rules than it is to heal a person. That on the Sabbath, you can't do any work at all. The Essenes said you couldn't even pray on the Sabbath. It would be breaking the Sabbath. Praying. The Pharisees, if you laid a hand on somebody on the Sabbath, nope, that's, that's work. Can't do that on the Sabbath. They had rules upon rules upon rules about what it took to break the Sabbath. And what Jesus, what's at stake for Jesus here, is the heart of God, the nature of God. Because bound up in this worldview of the rule-breaking equals what? Judgment. Um, rule-breaking equals something bad's going to happen. Yeah? That ominous feeling that, ooh, if I break the rules, then something bad is going to happen to me, so I can't break the rules. Right? You know that? You know that feeling? You know, people who, who really have that kind of a faith, it's almost a superstitious kind of faith. It's like, oh, well, we, I have to do this or else, and it's this idea, this idea that, that, that God's character and nature is that he has this stick in his hand and he's waiting to hit you, right? That that's the posture of the almighty God, right? And we see it in movies sometimes, this idea that God has this stick and he's waiting to hit you if you do the wrong thing. And Jesus has come to go, you've got the wrong idea. This is not the posture. The posture is open hand. The posture is, I am not afraid to lose my life for this because this man's life is valuable and I will say this and I will challenge you and I will bring everything that I have for this because this man is valuable to me and I'm going to show it to you. And you can't treat him as an object, object lesson. He's made in the image of God. And then the most fascinating thing that Jesus does he says to the man, stretch out your hand, and his hand was made whole like the other, like the other hand. Now I want to show you something. <laughs> Jesus never broke the Sabbath rules, even of the Essenes and the Pharisees. He didn't. In order to break one of their rules, he has to pray for him, or he has to lay his hand on him, and he doesn't. Isn't that fascinating? Sharp mind. Think about this. What does Jesus do? He says, you, stretch out your hand. And he does, which is not breaking the law either. <laughs> Who does the work? Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Who does the work? So the Pharisees go out and they start plotting. How are we going to destroy this guy? And they're like, all right, well, what did he do? He, 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 he did it again, <laughs> you know? Like, what did he do? He didn't, he didn't lay a hand on him. 
He didn't pray for him. He didn't invoke the name of God. He didn't do anything like that. He just said, stretch out your hand. And his hand was healed like the other. Why? Because he's more valuable than a sheep. Sharp mind. Here's the other thing, right? If they're looking to accuse and condemn, who does the work? Who are they going to be condemning? Who are they going to be accusing? Oh, they're stuck. Right? Sharp mind. Jesus, aware of this, they went off to plot his death, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him. And he healed them all. It's, it's really, like, just as a side note there, when Jesus uh, heals, he often sees that as vindication for his ministry. He's, he's proof that he is who he says he is, right? That happens uh, two chapters before, or three chapters before in Matthew 9. Um, but it happens other times, too, where he's like, well, if you don't believe my words, just believe the works, right? He, he definitely draws this parallel. Uh, and then it says this. So it, he ordered them not to make him known, everybody that he's healing. And this was to fulfill what was spoken of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, this is Matthew quoting Isaiah, saying this is who Jesus is. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He will proclaim justice to the Gentiles or to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, right? It's not a yelling match. Nor will anyone hear his voice in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. I think he's speaking right to the, to the person with the withered hand there, right? Somebody who's vulnerable, somebody who's weak, somebody who's on the outskirts, somebody who's, uh, he's not going to break. He's not going to put that wick out. He's, he's going to bring that back to life until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. This is who Matthew sees Jesus as. Somebody who's going to stand up, who's going to speak, who's going to defend the vulnerable. Sharp minds defend the vulnerable. Sharp minds keep in step with the Spirit. Sharp minds are humble. Sharp minds are quick to listen, so to slow to speak. Proverbs 12, 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Sometimes when we think about sharp minds, we, 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 we get the wrong idea. We, we, we might think of like, um, we might think of an aggressive posture. But Jesus doesn't have an aggressive posture. He's got a confident posture. He's got a humble posture. He's got an open hand posture. He has a sharp mind. So what does it look like for us to defend the vulnerable, to keep in step with the spirit, to be humble? I'm going to only give you one minute on this one. How does God want us to use our sharp mind? What does that look like in your day-to-day -day life? This is the application piece of the sermon. Yeah? What does it look like for you to use your sharp mind? You have one minute. Go.
Uh, we've got to be pretty quick on this one. Time is running. Maybe if we could have some people throw back some things very quickly, very quick ones. Yeah, so no time for the mic to run around. Anyone, just very quick, nice and loud, how is Jesus calling you to use your sharp mind? What situation? To stay with the needy person till there's a breakthrough. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, awesome. Sharp mind. What does it look like? Yeah. Yeah. Using your sharp mind for good, not for evil. And then knowing, right? The discernment of knowing when am I using it for good and when am I using it for evil? Because sometimes that's, that can be a blurred line. Sometimes it's obvious, right? But sometimes it's, oh, where, when is that selfish and when is that, where, where is that motivation? Good. What else? Yeah. No? Oh, I saw a hand. Somebody making a point. Anything else? All right. Um, yes. Yeah. So the sharp mind in partnership with the fruit of the Spirit, with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Right? So having a sharp mind doesn't mean not having self-control, right? Having a sharp mind means gentleness. Having a sharp mind, like, I, and, I, and I really like that because sometimes we think, oh, yeah, fruit of the Spirit is good in church, but how does it work in the world, right? Having a sharp mind for justice looks like the fruit of the Spirit. That's good. Um, in the U.S., uh, they are... That we have this issue that's rising in, in our national consciousness, and it's sports gambling, because it's just become elite. It's just become legal in 38 states in the U.S. So when I watch U.S. sports now, there's often more gambling, advertising, and stuff like that. And I think about Australia and how we've had that for a long time, but how we've put different things in place, and how even right now, Wesley Mission is, is at the forefront using a prophetic voice in gentleness to challenge, Grace Cough, the, the establish, you know, um, the establishment saying sports gambling is killing people, right? But the U.S. is running headlong into that. What does it look like for us to use a sharp mind to defend the vulnerable? I think that's one of the ways as Wesley Mission that we're doing that. Um, but there's a lot of complicated situations where we need to come in with a sharp mind. I'm just going to touch on Israel, Gaza, Hamas, that mess right now. Sharp mind. That's where we need sharp mind. We can't go blindly along. We need to have a sharp mind asking that question, asking Jesus' question. What is God's heart here? What does it look like to have God's heart in this situation? Knowing that the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. What does it look like? We need to be praying. First and foremost, we need to be praying. We need to be praying for Israel. We need to be praying. One person uh, who led the prayer at our service at Ride last week, she was leading the prayer and, and leading with the story of Jehoshaphat when Israel was surrounded by three other countries at war and, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, he called a fast. And he called the people together and said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And I thought that was such a powerful word, such a powerful prayer and such a powerful posture of having a sharp mind, not a sharp mind that goes, okay, we've got to do something now, but a sharp mind that goes, Lord, we don't know what to do, and our eyes are on you. You're the source of wisdom. That's where we need to go, right? Having a sharp mind means being in step with the Spirit, 
And so what does it look like when we pray for Israel? Pray that they would come at it with, because Israel has been attacked many times throughout the, the scriptures and beyond, right? We need to pray that they would not do evil in the eyes of the Lord, as often they've done. But we also need to pray that they would have wisdom from heaven. And we need to pray for peace. We need to also be praying for Palestinians. Because how much more valuable are people than sheep? <laughs> right? We can so dehumanize people. That's not. We need to pray for Palestinians. Especially people who are caught in the middle. They never wanted this. We need to be in prayer. We need to be praying. We need to be praying for peace. We need to be praying for God's heart. And finally, we need to be praying that people would have a revelation of Jesus. Because as trite as it sounds, it is the only answer. <laughs> because, and, and, and the answer is more at hand than you would think, because Muslims already account Jesus as the Messiah. Right? In the Quran, it stipulates Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah that Israel has been longing for. And, Israel, and Jesus is the Messiah that we already know he is. And so for Jesus to be lifted up as the Messiah is the answer. <laughs> and so we need to be praying for Jesus to be lifted up. We need to be praying th and, and, and not... Uh, gosh, I think sometimes our, our prayers are, are, or our, our, our viewpoints can be a bit blind and, and what it could lead to you know, if you just blindly support Israel, they could be walking into a quagmire. Like, this could be Vietnam 2.0, right? Like, it could be a trap. We need to be praying. Not just, like, blindly supporting. We need to be praying, right? And, um, and having the mind of Christ together, I'm going to finish with this verse. Because this is, this is sharp minds right here. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 2, Paul, he, he finishes, uh, no, sorry, he didn't finish his letter this way, but he's talking in uh, Philippians 2. I'm finishing my message this way. Paul begins his letter this way. He says, have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That's the mind of Christ that we are invited to share in. Having the mind of Christ is possibly the greatest gift given to the church. Think about that. We can share the mind of Christ. We can have the mind of Christ. If Jesus reveals more of his mind to us. And so I want to encourage us to have the mind of Christ. Have this mind amongst yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we want to pray as your people call by your name. We pray for the situation in Israel right now, God, and in Gaza and in that situation, Lord. We pray, we pray your heart into that situation, Lord. We want to be attuned to you. We want to be walking in step with your spirit, Lord. We pray, we pray for peace. We pray for the Prince of Peace to be revealed. We pray for a humble posture, a posture that says, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And that, Lord, there would be a leading of the Spirit. Lord, that there would be a coming together, um, Lord, and, and something that, humanly speaking, is impossible. And, Lord, in that, you would be lifted up. That, Lord, you would bring a solution where there hasn't been a solution for lifetimes. But Lord, that you would bring it. 
and that you would be lifted up. That you would be lifted up as you rightly should be. Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come. Pray that your will would be done on earth. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.